together again on the day we are together again i will pull you in close like a hoop with no end on the day we are together again we will share the same table again we will share the same table again i will pass you the salt the candle i will bend when we share the same table again we will walk around the block hand in hand we will walk around the block hand in hand we will stop for a snack at the taco truck stand when we walk around the block hand in hand so Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate your time. It's good to see you all in chat. Um, today, we are going to be talking about Kyron Horman, one of the greatest missing children's cases in the modern era. Uh, we have a special guest. Um, her name is Samantha. She has a channel called Missing uh, Pacific Northwest, it's PNW for Pacific Northwest Crimes Revisited. She's dedicated a lot, a lot of time uh, in the Kyron Horman case. And she's uh, knows quite a bit about this case for sure. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them in chat. Kyron definitely needs to be found. His family deserves answers for sure. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Samantha up and we will get started. Uh, by the way, uh, the link for uh, Samantha's channel is in the description for those of you in the live chat and for the replay crew. So uh, 
please take uh, time to go over to her channel and subscribe. Hello, Samantha. How are you doing? Hi, Justin. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, you got to you. Uh, we was on. Um, we were we were on a panel together the other day, Crime weren't we? Sleuthen. Somewhere, yeah, Crime Sleuthing. We were on with Crime Sleuthing. Yeah, I've got the memory of a goldfish, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> okay, all right. So, how did you how did you get started in the uh, the Kyron Horman uh, case? Well, I don't live far from where he came up missing. I instantly was just super drawn to the case. And during the pandemic, um, I'm stuck at home. I start getting into Facebook groups. I'm checking things out. And then I got invited um, a couple of years ago to do case studies with oh. Tyron Horman's stepbrother, Terry oh, Horman's wow. son. Yeah. That's amazing. And it all started from a Facebook group that we were in. And nice. I had already been in this group, you know, talking with people about Kyron's case. I wasn't sure whether Terry Horman was 100% responsible for Kyron's disappearance or not. And especially because I was seeing a lot of information and was receiving a lot of information from other people in this group. And so I took all of this information and ran with it and started doing case studies on many of those people. And um, awesome. the case studies didn't go anywhere. I couldn't find right. them. They all had like a dead end and things just weren't adding up. And then the people that were doing case studies with um, the stepbrother started coming up with a lot of conspiracy theory type stuff. And I don't know from there, I just kind of like left them to do their own thing. And I eventually started my own group, Kyron Horman case revisited. It took off because I started revisiting the area where he came from or where he disappeared from. Mm -hmm. And started showing videos on YouTube and yeah, I mean, it was super exciting to do and it gave me a whole new perspective and it's given a lot of other people a perspective because people don't understand the type of area that, you know, Kyron disappeared from. This isn't a normal area. This area isn't house after house, drive after driveway, basketball hoops, that kind of thing. We're talking kind of in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's a rainforest be behind the school that he disappeared from, Skyline right. Elementary School. So, um, and in my group, I met a woman, her name is Kalia. We became partners. She's an amazing mm -hmm. researcher. And she started doing research on a blogger, um, Christina Stoy from Blink on Crime. And she did a lot, a lot of blogs on Chiron. I mean, Kaylee has spent hours going through over 9,000 comments um, with Terry and Dee Dee in the comments section. She, oh. upon the fact that this blogger had actually done interviews with Dee Dee and Terry and they kind of befriended Christina Stoy. And then her blogs started turning into rumors and lies and misinformation because she's getting all of her information from Dee Dee Spicer and Terry Horman. And it sucked for me <laughs> because yeah. I found out that all of the case studies that I had been doing were all on people that had been mentioned by this blogger, all except for one. And then after talking to Detective Tabor, which is the detective on Kyron Horman's case, he pretty much confirmed that many of my case studies had already been looked into and that those people had been, a lot of those people had been cleared or that they were just pure rumor. Mm, okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So, uh, so tell us about, Kyron and uh, how it all took place. Well, Kyron was seven years old when he came up missing on June 4th, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, he was at his school science fair. Uh, that morning, him, 
uh, Terry Horman, who is his stepmother and his baby mm -hmm. sister. They arrive at the school shortly after eight o'clock in the morning. And once they get to the school, they go in, they leave his backpack and coat in his classroom. He leaves some books with the librarian in his class and they start wandering around the school, looking at all the other children's science fair projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And during that time, Terry Horman snapped the last picture taken of Chiron. Right there. Yes, right that there. picture. Yep. Mm -hmm. And after this picture was taken, Terry says she left the school by herself without Chiron, mm -hmm. and he was never seen again. Right. Now, yeah. from there, Terry starts creating her timeline for the day and everything else. I mean, there were witnesses that came forward later that said that Chiron had left with Terry, that he was walking behind Terry, headed towards yeah. her truck there at the school. And what yeah. kind of truck was she? She was driving the white truck. Is that correct? Yes, she was driving Kane Horman's truck that day. She had told okay. Kane Horman okay. that she needed to borrow the truck so that she could bring Kyron's science fair project home that day. But the science fair project never came home, and the science fair projects weren't supposed to be brought home until the following week. So yes. immediately, you know, something fishy is kind of going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know... She leaves the school and she goes to two different Fred Myers. One Fred Myers, I guess, didn't have this Tylenol or Motrin that she was looking for for her daughter because her mm -hmm. daughter had an earache. Correct. And then she goes to a second Fred Myers. Thank you, Janice. Um, and then after that is where her story starts getting really fishy. She says that she went to the dry cleaners that was in the same um, shopping center as the second Fred Myers, which has mm -hmm. been verified. Uh, Kalia actually verified it with a news reporter, Kyle Eboshi in Portland, Oregon, because he did a story on it. Question. And was this, was this exactly after she left the school? Yes. She was time stamped at Fred Myers with a receipt at, 9 12 a.m in the morning okay and when she arrives to the second fred myers she runs into a woman that she knew from the gym and showed her a picture of chiron which this woman says that they were acquaintances but she found that it was kind of odd that in the parking lot you know she's sharing sure. a picture of chiron yeah. it was kind of raining outside um, the baby had an earache. She knew the baby was sick because Terry had told her so. So it was just an awkward, you know, meeting. And sure. uh, sure. Terry showed that picture of Kyron to several people throughout the day. And it kind of looked like she was trying to make an alibi for herself. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that 100%. Yeah. You know, she also says that she went to an Albertson store and she went to a craft store. And we know that she did not go to the craft store because I found a news clipping of um, Desiree Young mentioning that she did not go to the craft store. And footage showed that she wasn't at Albertsons. Immediately, law enforcement is starting to chase their tails a little bit, trying to catch up with Terry and her timeline because things aren't making sense. Immediately. Yeah, yeah. Now, was is could she have had Kyron in the car? In the truck? In the truck, rather, yes. Um, well, if she left the school with Kyron, which I believe she did, I'm 100% believe that she's responsible for whatever happened to Kyron. Um, yeah, left in the truck with her. Um, from there. I, you know, I've never been able to piece anything together of where he went from there. But sometime during the day, you know, things just changed. Like, 
I don't know. I think she met up with someone, maybe dropped him off or something like that may have happened. Mm. I have a video here I want to show with you, if that's okay. Yeah. And it's a video of the different discrepancies in Terry's story. You're going to see a few different clips. Yes, um, we'll Terry just... is the stepmother. Ter Terry yeah. is the stepmother. Desiree is the Chiron's bio mother. Correct. And um, in these clips, you'll hear the parents talking about her different stories throughout the day. Okay. Let's okay. real quick. Um... I agree, Karma. You know, yeah, Terry's uh, never, never made sense whatsoever. The only one that came back and said, oh, well, maybe I forgot about the craft store I went to. Uh, and then we start backing into it. Well, the, well, there was no camera footage that proves that you were there and well, there the lady says you weren't there either, and you know you start really tearing it apart. And, and well, that wasn't really true. And so, well, maybe I was at the craft store on a different day, and you know there were so many different versions of what she was telling people and where she was at. I still know to this day what I had for lunch. I know everything I did that day. That was the day that our world turned upside down. I can tell you where I was. There's no way that she doesn't know where she was at. Uh, the day at the school and what she did at school that day, her accounts of it to me are completely different. What did she tell you that is different? Well, this is important. My story from her was that they went up to that, up that main set of stairs by the office and they parted ways right in front of the office. And, and that's according to law enforcement, that was her second version when they also felt like it wasn't jiving with them. They contra they countered her in can the you interview. Pause that for one and second? then that's when she said Sure. Now can you uh so the way the school is set, you can see down the hall, right? You can yes. like if you go up the stairs. So see. when you get to the very front of the school, which faces uh -huh. south, there is double doors there. And when you enter the very front of the school, there's a stairwell that goes down and there's a stairwell that goes up. When you go up, you're on the top floor and that's where Kyron was in room 209. And yeah. um, when you go downstairs, then you're you're downstairs. So, yeah, there's like a, a tri-level stairwell there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And then when you're on the second floor, the east side of the school, actually, there's a doorway where you can get out. But if you want to go out the west side of the school, you have to travel down to the bottom um, of the school to go out the doors to get out to, like, the soccer field area. And Terry says she saw Kyron walking down the hall, getting ready to go into his homeroom. Yes. Um, her, her stories changed about how she left the school. But now she is saying that she left out the east side of the doors where the buses are. And I've actually got like a video clip to show everyone. And then if they want to further look at the school, I did a, an entire live all the way around the school that people can go and watch. Um, it's called Ground Zero. It's an amazing video that gives you so much perspective about the school and the entire area. Awesome. Very good. Okay. Then she went up the front staircase. Mm -hmm. Let me look how far he's going. He's not going that far. Mm -hmm. And even if they did split right there, you're going to tell me that he got picked by a stranger in about 50 feet. Excuse me. I saw 209. This is actually wrong on the Dr. Phil show. His classroom is room 213. I needed to correct myself. Sure. This was sure. in my head when I saw it. His classroom's actually all the way at the very, very end here. Um, Dr. Phil got it wrong on a show. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and willingly walked out the door with someone that he didn't know. Absolutely not. Not a and, chance. And that hall would have been populated. Oh, yeah. yes. With tons of yeah. people that all know each other.
the last time she saw him, she was down by the main office and he was here outside his classroom? I think he was coming this way down the hall and she was turning and going the other way. I don't know if it was down the stairs out or out the side door. I can't remember which version of the story it was at the time, which changed a few times. So, uh, oh, it did? It was, yeah, going somewhere that way. So right there, right behind Kane, is the stairwell that you can take to get down to the west side of the school that leads to the soccer field. In mm -hmm. front of where Kane is standing is a very long hallway that goes all the way to the east doors where the bus the bus is parked and the bus driver Kyron's actual bus driver is one of the witnesses that said that he or she saw Kyron walking with Terry towards the truck so uh, obviously I mean this is a small community I grew up in a small community we know our mm -hmm. bus driver our bus driver knows us probably our families as well they're exactly. very intimate with every you know they know every single child on their bus route they know where they live obviously so he's going to know chiron and he's going to know terry exactly he, i have mentioned that several times on my channel that this witness is a very very good witness to have in this case and they have spoken with the grand jury i mean Yes, and it's amazing witness because you are correct. Like they're going to know who Kyron is. They see him every single day. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. The, that is a very good witness. It was at the time, which changed a few times. So, uh, oh, it did. It was yeah, going somewhere that way. Hey Terry, I'm Dan Tilkin with Channel 2 News. One of the important questions for investigators, why did Terry Horman borrow the white truck from Kane the day Kyron disappeared? He says with the intention of using it to bring Kyron's science fair project home, but the project remained at school. Desiree your question? and your husband. Yes. Um, what? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just no. want to know for my own self. Uh, what kind of car did Terry drive pre normally she had a red mustang with a license plate red squirrel on the okay. back so listen my kids just did a science fair project three weeks ago maybe mm -hmm. two weeks ago i mean it's a board you don't need you know a, a diesel f250 or whatever to take a science fair board to school exactly mm -hmm. that you know it, and she it, borrowed his truck the day before on the third too she said that sh she had went and done some recycling the day before um up at the fred myers the very first one that she visited the day that Dr. Kyron came up missing she said she took her daughter to the doctor's office and um she had had an earache she had finished her amoxicillin and um she was still having pain in her ears and she needed Tylenol or needed to be seen. Doctor says, give her some Tylenol. And that was the day before. But she, I find it, in my opinion, very suspicious that she had the truck the day before. When it wasn't uncommon for her to borrow the truck, but it wasn't often. It wasn't regularly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, her borrowing the truck the day before to me is a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if yeah. if it was in today's world and it was, you know, a newer truck, we would probably know exactly where the truck had been because there's GPS, right, in all mm -hmm. the trucks now and everything. So, but um, it wasn't that way then. You want me to go ahead and continue then? Yep. And are saying that you know where Kyron is. Do you know? And why, according to sources, did she lead Kyron's teacher to believe he he had a doctor's appointment the day he disappeared when he didn't? Mm -hmm. When did you become suspicious? So I just want to go over this doctor's appointment because this is something that causes a lot of confusion for people. 
So I have a text message or a Facebook message. Desiree says that there was an email sent to Ms. Porter that he had a doctor's appointment. Uh, the day Kyron went missing, Terry Horman told the teacher that Kyron had a doctor's appointment because a lot of people want to know why didn't the school call the parents and let him know that he was marked absent at 10 a.m. And it's because Miss Porter thought that Kyron was going to a doctor's appointment. She didn't feel it necessary to call. Right. And I think that was just, you know, <laughs> in her so they, case, and it so being they, 13 years later, I'm sorry to interrupt, no, but yeah, I mean, she really, like, Desiree was able to confirm the night that Kyron came up missing, or officers were, because she's signing, you know, documents for them to get from the doctor's office to, you know, the disclosure, disclosure paperwork or whatever, so mm -hmm. that they could, if they could tell whether or not he had a doctor's appointment and he didn't have a doctor's appointment that day. And he didn't have one the following week as Terry would then later change her story and said that it was for the following week. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I can't, I cannot tell you how many cases I have done when it's it's step parents man step parents it's you know if you if you have good step parents count yourself if you have step parents and they're good count it as a blessing but i have seen so many step parents do this to to kids and it's scary yeah, they give the good step parents a bad name. That's for sure. My ama my husband's an amazing stepdad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he's been in my kid's life for a long time. So yeah. 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 Just of her. Uh, first polygraph results came back. She was very vocal with everyone in the entire house about how it went, how that she failed. And then the actions after that, and the discussions that we had trying to understand what happened that day, she would change her story daily, mm -hmm. if not more than that. I mean, every time you talk to her, it was a little bit different about, well, here's what happened that day. And it, you know, you kind of look at her going, you know, we have a major crisis here and you don't even have a story that's believable at this point. Well, there's parts of the story. Yeah, I mean, these clips are just so telling. You have the parents saying she didn't only change her story. She changed her story multiple times, sometimes a day. I mean, the truth is so universal much. and it doesn't change. And you can check it out. It's that simple. It's really that simple. You don't have to lie to this person and tell this other person something different. It is eternal and it won't mm -hmm. change and it doesn't matter if it was that day or 14 years from now right it shouldn't have changed one bit right because you know a person changing their story especially when a child is missing something's up there's red flags and i mean they honed on on, on her immediately because of her stories changing. She could not come up with a good timeline. She could not come up with where she was that day, which we'll get to shortly. Like the story of like what she did that entire day makes absolutely no sense. Yes. This clip yes. that I'm about to show here is actually an interview that was never filmed. It's just a recording. Um, Kalia found this diving deep. And this is basically terry horman starts spreading all kinds of rumors immediately and they're clearing it up in this interview story in the beginning about desiree and terry being friends and they weren't yeah right that um, comes from terry herself there is the statement of i hired terry to take care of kyron there which is go. completely false yeah right. she had a full-time job right and um, I was already, as right now, we're already taking care of Kyron ourselves mm -hmm. um, before she had any involvement in that regard. Um, and so this was deception that Terry passed to friends and built up this mythology. Yes. Correct. And, but, but this was not, uh, this was not accurate. 
Correct. Right. Um, I'm yeah, she went around telling everybody that Desiree and her were friends, and they were not friends. They never were friends. Matter of fact, they didn't really get along. They didn't even really like each other. There was a request to, I guess, dig up or excavate your property, your yard. Oh, search, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And you said no. Yes. And that bothered you. Yes, definitely. Okay, why would you not? I have an open invitation with law enforcement and the search and rescue teams, the certified search and rescue teams, to search my property any day, any time. When I was called, I said no to the private search, but I, I immediately said, and I will continue to say right now, any time, any time the sheriff's office and the search and rescue teams want to come with their dogs. It's already, my property, I'll qualify with, my property's been searched more than the school has probably. And my invitation is open always open i'm glad for you to say you're willing to have that search anytime, anytime. and and you're not saying that you want to search because you think he did something wrong you're just saying some there could be evidence. yeah i don't think he's responsible but i think she's uh terry in my opinion is Yes, and Terry immediately starts pointing out to everybody that Kane wouldn't even allow search dogs on his property. It was just another way for her to try to control this narrative and point fingers and deflect. Um, Kane did not want private searchers there. One in particular, Harry Oaks, um, he's quite famous for searching and stuff, but he hasn't even got his license to be out searching. And the thing is, if you're bringing in these dogs and they're searching the property and stuff and they're not licensed. If they find something and things aren't done right, this proof, this stuff that they could find, it can't be used in the case anymore yeah. because yeah. it's been tainted. Yeah. So he's yeah. just saying law enforcement can come anytime they want, but he just didn't want any private searchers. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the end of that clip. Um, after she leaves the second Fred Meyer, she says she goes to the cleaners. We've been able to verify that. She says she went to an Albertsons. She says she went to a craft store. That's not true. After that, she says that she starts driving around to soothe the baby. The baby has an earache. She's sick. She's just trying to soothe. The thing about this that bothers me the most is I've traveled in this area where her phone was pinging on Rocky Point, um, Dixie Mountain, and up these very, very elevated roads. And me and my husband's ears are popping. And all I could think mm. of, it just dawned on me one day, like, this baby's traveling around in all these areas? Why? Aren't, I bet you that baby's ears were hurting. Oh, I bet. It was, for sure. Especially if you and then the, it, there's already pressure on the eardrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then during this time that is completely unaccounted for, they've been able to, you know, use her GPS, use her phone, her phone pinging on cell phone towers and stuff to pretty much gather up a good timeline of the day. So they are able to determine that Terry Horman was not where she said she was throughout the entire day. Yeah. But. And why biggest... would you lie? Right. Why would you lie about that? Mm -hmm. you and the more she lied the you know, the more they went off on a goose chase trying to verify her. They even put her inside of a police vehicle and said, okay, you can't tell me where you went. Show me where you went. She couldn't do that either. Yeah. Now, um, during this unaccounted time, here's a really big key part of this story. She has a friend. Her name is. Do you Katie want me to Stone. show? Do you want me to show the school where it's at, or? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. I'll. I'll you don't got to take it down. That's fine. I'll just. Uh pop this up this is the school and it's next to this is a river no the river? um 
Oh, that's Savvy Island, I think, is where you're at. Oh, okay. Maybe I entered the wrong address then. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm at Savvy Island. Okay. Okay, enter the wrong address. Sorry. One, one. Let me see here. Did I enter the wrong address? Five, six. Skyland. Skyline Boulevard. In Portland as well. Okay. All right. So this is the school. Very tiny school, right? Like there's nothing. Yeah, it is. Nothing here. Let me pop us down here so they can see it better. Literally, like, forced in the back. And do you know, like, what the population of the school was here? No, I don't, actually. Mm, I know okay. that the day of the science fair, there was, it's been said 300 people, it's been said 400 people, but there were lots of people there at the school that day. That's another way that Terry tries to control the narrative a little bit and say that, you know, there was so many at the, so many people at the school and it was just chaotic. Like anybody could have taken him because there was no sign in is, sheet at the school. Is the school still in a school? Is it still a school? Yes, it is. Okay. So right here, would you stop right there? Go back where you yep. were. Right here. Yep. And move mm -hmm. forward a little bit. Sure. Tell me when. Go Tell forward me when. a little bit more. So right there to the right-hand side. Nope. Back up. Right here? Back up one more time. Oh, one more time. Yep. Okay. Oh, you were right on top of it. Forward one more time. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get this little brown spot right there. It's perfect. Right here? Yep. That the is drain? the drain on the side of the mm -hmm. road. This is where Terry Horman parked her truck that day. It's in front of the school. And if you back out a little bit, you'll notice there's a little bit of a hillside there. And when you're up in front of the school looking towards the road, that hillside is so, you know, so high, you cannot see a vehicle parked there. You may have been able to see the truck, but you definitely can't see my SUV and it's pretty high. Uh, it's a right. four-wheel drive. Um, and law enforcement says that witness and witnesses had came forward and said that the truck was moved from there up Access Road. That little road that's there in front mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. kind of see going to the right-hand side. Yes, mm -hmm. that's Access Road. And they also said that someone may have been in the truck while the science fair was going in or around the truck is what law, law enforcement says. So oh, sometime okay. that morning they're parked out front. And then sometime that morning, that truck got moved up that access road. And that sign right there was actually posted up on the sign about the um, science fair that day. And then later on, there was supposed to be a talent show. Well, okay. I mean, this is farm country. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is definitely And that's farm Brooks country. Hill Cemetery, or Cemetery, Brooks Hill Church, mm -hmm. where yeah. they had their first news conference. That's where they met up a lot. The, um, a lot of uh, people in the area that were providing, like, food and drink and stuff for people um, mm -hmm. that were doing the search all met up there a lot. Yeah, these are steep hills right here. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So if you keep going back that way, keep going forward. Yep, to that crosswalk area. Mm -hmm. And then look towards the school. Now, this is the east side of the school. Up close to the school, there's a door there on the east side. And that's where the bus is parked. They would travel around. The, yes, yes. They would travel right. around right. the back side of the school and then face forward. And Kyron 
Corman's bus driver was facing forward when she said that Terry and the baby were traveling down with Kyron in tow. So he was following her. And the other witnesses that saw Kyron, he actually stopped to talk to one of his friends. And his grandmother was there and also witnessed seeing them leave. So there's more than just one witness. There's several witnesses that seen her leave with Kyron that day. Got you. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. You want to, did you want to play the video now? Um, or what? Tell me. Let me see. Well, I kind of want to finish. Okay. So this unaccounted time, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where she can't tell anyone where she's at, at the same time that this is going on, she's got a girlfriend named Dee Dee Spicer who they started looking into in this case also. Neither one of them have ever been called a person of interest or a suspect, but they have both been I've the main focus. That. I've never understood that, to be honest with you. But um, Well, in Oregon, they normally try not to name a person of interest or a suspect because, you know, if something later down the road comes up and then they're not the people or whatever lawsuits can be, but Oregon is really weird like that. That's just yeah. something they normally don't do. They will call her a person of interest and a suspect when they put the cuffs on her. That's how they, that's how they. Yeah. Work. yeah. Um, but Dee Dee Spicer and her both became the main focus of this investigation. Dee Dee Spicer was working at West Wind Farms and it's only, is there any way you can look up your GPS, please? At West yeah. Wind Farm Studios, I want to say it's thirteen thousand Old Germantown Road. Okay, one second. This is where Dee Dee Spicer was working the day that Kyron came up missing. It's 13, only thousand. thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay, Germantown Road. Oh, Old Germantown, Germantown Road. Road. Here we go. It could be Northwest Germantown Road, but oh, is that there it? it is. Okay. So, this is where Dee Dee Spicer was working that day. She arrived at work at 9 a.m. in the morning. She goes in. She talks to her employer, tries to get her, do, you know, gets told her duties for the day, goes out onto the property, and starts working. Dee Dee Spicy, Dee Dee Spicer herself said that she was working near the road along the fence line at the far end of the property. They so were supposed to at? go. Is it up that here? would be, yes, the blue line is the road. So she was anywhere. This is over 70 acres worth of property. 40 of it. What is, kind of business is this? It's got, it's like a lavender farm. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. This is actually one of the far ends of the property that I end up showing in one of my videos. If you go back to the right a little bit, this is one of the furthest parts of the property Got where it. she said that she was going to be but she goes in she gets her duties for the day and she's supposed to go to lunch with her employer and her employees lunchtime comes and they can't find Dee. Dee. she's left oh, her cell phone that. she's left her cell phone in the car her car's still left on the property but Dee Dee's nowhere to be seen Later, a witness says that they seen her abruptly leave West Wind Farms. And it's just really crazy because this employer, she looks for her. She calls her phone. The employees are hollering for her. Um, she was given duties for the day. So why wasn't she where she was supposed to be? They could not mm -hmm. find her. An employer is responsible for their employee. She could have had a heart attack, gotten stung by bees, fallen in a hole, like who knows. But she searched and she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Dee Dee Spicer is uh, Terry's friend. So that's Kyron. Terry is Kyron's stepmother. And Dee Dee is Kyron's stepmother's friend 
Yes, they met at a gym in 2002. They knew each other for about eight years. There's lots of speculation that they may have they been lovers. They sisters, couldn't they? Yeah, they both have red, red curly hair. hair. Yeah. Curly red hair, yeah. I think they were lovers, in my opinion. Yeah. A lot of people have talked about it. You know, even Desiree Young, Kyron's mom, mm -hmm. says they were lovers. And yeah. that Dee Dee helped Terry because Dee Dee was in love with Terry, um, allegedly, and um, that she would just do anything for Terry. So she's missing a lot longer, though, than Terry Horman is. I found a news clipping that talked about her being missing for almost four hours when the original time was only 90 minutes. And then it changed to about two and a half to three hours. And then the last clip that I had found said she was missing up to four hours, even though, and, and it just changed from the very beginning. I mean, that's a lot of time to go from 90 minutes to almost 40 out, or four hours. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did have burner phones. And West Wind Farms was searched for Kyron Horman multiple times. And the flyer, there was one flyer that came out with um, Kyron and Terry in the truck with like, I don't know, uh, questionnaires for the students and the adults and stuff. But then in August, the new flyers. I'll show you that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the new flyers that came out in August show Dee Dee Spicer and Terry Horman. And they also searched Dee Dee's condo. They searched Dee Dee's aunt's house. Um, so... You know, law enforcement isn't going oh, to go out go. and start. Here we go. Here's yeah. those actual photos, right? Mm -hmm. Now, these aren't the actual photos of the truck. This is law enforcement reenacting where the truck oh, was. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So we, we just showed you guys there at the the uh, the school. And remember, I showed you that drain. We just showed you that drain. White Ford 250 at Skyline School. Did you see this truck between approximately 8.15 and 8.45, which would be a.m. on June 4th? Did you see anyone in or near this truck at those times? And obviously, uh, uh, Terry was parked down here and, like you said, may have went up on this road to go around. Yes, and there's also pictures there of the Fred Myers that she went to because when she does go to these two Fred and Myers, the interesting thing is is that she parks the truck way far out into the parking lots. I You're talking you, you have a sick child with you and mm -hmm. you're going to walk through the parking lot in the rain because it was very rainy from about 9 a.m. till about noon that day. I mean pouring down rain and she parks the furthest away from the grocery store right. and they Which had her park park out closer there. when it's raining you know so yeah and i mean well it's in the morning too and we all know grocery stores are full throughout the 24 hours that they're open or whatever the times that they're open but they're most busy at you know later in the afternoon when you're going to pick up something for dinner or something we're talking early in the morning plenty of parking spaces why are you parking so far out yes so they want to see if she's here at the uh the fred myers at 22075 northwest what is that uh embry embry uh, road embry okay uh mm -hmm. road hillsboro did you see this truck at approximately 9 a.m and then Walker Road, Fred Myers, 15995 South Walker Road. And that's, is it Beaverton? Yes. Did I pronounce it? Did you yep. see this truck at approximately 10 a.m.? So an hour later. And right, then... and the first Fred Myers is where she has the 912 receipt from. And she travels. See, she's saying she's looking for this tiny lot, tiny lot. 
Tylenol or Motrin. There uh -huh. was a um, recall on children's medicines at the time, but this is another, you know, something that everybody talks about. Oh, well, there was a recall. Well, that's why she had to go to the second Fred Myers. There was a recall, but there wasn't a shortage. The main right. Tylenol and Moultrin, you know, creators or whatever, there was still plenty of like K Kroger brand, off right. brand stuff. Right. And traveling to the second Fred Myers, if you're going to be dropped, dropping off dry cleaning stuff for your husband at the dry cleaners at the second Fred Myers. Why wouldn't you just travel there to begin with? Why even stop at this first Fred Myers? Mm -hmm. And then. And how far are these two apart from one another? Um, there were, they're about 10 minute drive. So there are plenty, plenty That's, of Walgreens yeah. and other stores to stop at, to get medicine. The That's funny thing about the second yeah. Fred Myers on Walker road is it's actually in the same area where the 24 hour fitness is that she goes to later in the day. And I've always found it very peculiar that she starts off in that area and that's also the last place that she goes is in that area. I'm talking an eighth of a mile away is where 24 hour fitness is. And I believe that this Fred Myers in that area is where she met up with someone. That's yeah. my opinion. Yeah. I have no proof of it. That's my she own speculation. A lot of stops, a lot of stops that morning, right? I mm -hmm. mean, she's going a lot of places now. Uh, where's this is, did you park your vehicle near the south side, left side of this photograph of the parking lot before 845? Okay. Is this, the, this is the school entrance, right? Is this the school entrance right here or is this the, the store entrance? I can't hear you. Yes, I believe that is the school. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, these forms are directed to anyone, teachers, school employees, delivery persons, parents, who was at the Skyline Road, either the buildings or grounds at any time between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. on June 4, 2010. Parents of children who were present on the campus between these hours but were not themselves present should fill out the page for students. Anyone else? who has been present, start at the beginning. If you have any questions regarding uh, the completion of this form, send it to an email. Okay. Um, we are requesting uh, that the form be returned by Sunday, June 20th, between 9 and 7, 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Your corporation is... Ex okay. There will be a uniform police officer... Yeah, because I'm sure people were scared at this time, you know, because, you know, I know a lot of people was eyeing Terry, but still, you know, people wasn't sure if somebody was out abducting kids either. That's right. And a matter of fact, um, they didn't know what to think about it. I mean, this was the largest search for any missing person in all of Oregon's history. And it was also yes. the largest incremental criminal investigation in Oregon's history on Terry Horman. And mm -hmm. um, law enforcement came forward and said, you don't, you don't need to worry. We do not think that this was a stranger abduction. Yeah. yeah. So they this hone was... in on Terry Horman immediately. She is actually um, talking and emailing people that end up going out on the news and stuff the day after Kyron comes up missing. Wow. I actually have those news clips that to show what she was emailing and stuff the very next day. And it has nothing to do with Kyron. It only has to do with herself and the, you know, being worried about herself. What do you, in your opinion, what is, do you think was, is the motive for, in your opinion, Kyron's disappearance? That's a hard question because I have mm -hmm. a couple. Um, 
one mode of being that Chiron was in the way of her having her perfect little family with just her and her daughter and her husband, Kane Horman. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think yeah, maybe Chiron was causing a little bit of um, trouble for her and her life, just having to take care of him and doing stuff. You know, in the year before, Kyron came up missing. There was a lot going on with Terry. I mean, she was taking antidepressants. She mm -hmm. was um, supposedly suffering from postpartum dep depression. She was drinking a lot. And if you're taking antidepressants and you're drinking and going through postpartum, you're probably not doing very well. You know, and her and Kane got into a fight the night before um, Kyron came up missing. Terry Horman says that they actually had discussed splitting up. So I don't Kane know if is, this was. Can you uh, just tell everyone who Kane is? If you don't Kane know. Horman is Kyron's father. Um, Correct, yes. And. You know, with the fight and everything the night before, them discussing, you know, splitting up and everything else, was that to punish him? Or yes. because of her hatred for Desiree Young, Kyron's mom, was it a punishment for her? Because mm -hmm. later in the month, Kane Horman finds out that there was a, an alleged murder for hire plot against him. Against him, exactly. Yes. So, um, uh, that's, that's significant. And yeah. that's when, when he's just had enough at that point. Yes, he absolutely did. <laughs> I'm, she had hired a landscaper that Kane did not know about. Correct. He was there working on the property, um, I guess to lift some, you know, load off of her son, James and to help and stuff but months prior to Kyron's disappearance allegedly she hired him to kill Kane he found out about it and he took the baby and he left and he also filed for divorce he was out don't blame him she yeah don't blame him and, and then we know a lot of filicide which is you know, parents unaliving, it's usually their own kids, uh, but is because of, it can be revenge against the other parent or a step parent mm -hmm. uh, because you, you want to hurt them so bad. And that's the probably the worst way you can hurt them is by hurting someone that means the entire world to them, obviously. Right. So, and okay. um, when he does file for that and he takes the baby and leaves, that's the 11 days that Dee Dee Spicer decides to come stay with Terry um, for 11 days. And during that time, cell phone burner phones were bought so that they could communicate. There was also another woman that had a burner phone. These were people that Terry had hanging around her. They said it was because they wanted to try to get a hold of attorneys and whatnot because they thought they were being listened to. But it's mentioned that they wouldn't talk inside the house. They would talk outside. I mean, why are you buying burner phones and why are you worried why law enforcement's listening in if you have nothing to hide? Huge yeah. red flag. There's a lot of red flags in this case from day one, oh, it, really. <laughs> it would take me days and days and days to tell you the entire story. Because yeah. I can't even tell you how many lies I've, li lives I've done trying to cover this case. Yeah, quite a bit. Okay, so this is uh, Terry, the three on the top. Mm -hmm. And down here, this is Dee Dee. Yep, Dee Dee Spicer. She's walking out 
from after talking, well, she got called into the grand jury and didn't end up talking there on the left hand side, giving a smile to the camera. To me, she's pure evil. And I even wonder sometimes if she's more evil than Terry Horman. Really? Yes. I absolutely do. I um has she done actually, any interviews? She did an interview with People Magazine, and she did do an interview with that blogger that I spoke of earlier, Christina uh -huh. Stoy, and she uh -huh. kind of told her story about, you know, she was saying that she was there at West Wind Farms all day. She never left work. You know, law enforcement actually took her back up to West Wind Farms, and they did this whole reenactment of her and law enforcement hollering for her because she said she didn't hear anybody hollering for her that day looking for her and of course she says oh yeah i can hear that well of course you're gonna say you can hear it when you've got law enforcement standing right next to you and they're they can obviously hear it too sure so she's gonna be you know i can hear this but you know when it comes to her, law enforcement isn't going to put a whole bunch of time into searching her condo, searching where she worked, searching her aunt's house, and, um, you know, putting her on flyers unless they've got good reason to believe that she had something to do with Tyron's disappearance. Um Somebody that worked with law enforcement and Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, which is who takes care of Kyron's case, Bruce McCain, said she was so adamant about knowing for a fact that Terry had nothing to do with Kyron's disappearance. And he thought that that was really strange because how could you know exactly what she was doing and that she didn't have anything to do with it if you haven't spoken with her or talked to her? Because Dee Dee had said she hadn't spoken with Terry since March of 2010 at Terry Horman's birthday party. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, they're connected at the hips. They're besties. She's running to the rescue. Wow. And the burner phones were bought in cash under a fake name. Now, I they don't speak have... anymore, supposedly, do they? Well, unless they're talking on burner phones because one of Terry's ex- Exes down in California said that she was still carrying around a burner phone. In my opinion, they still talk. I uh, yeah. Um, I have a clip about the burner phones I'd like to play. Sure. It really paints a story. I think so. Let me see. Sure. Here it is. There we go. K2 News has learned the role prepaid cell phones are playing in the case. Multiple sources tell K2 News in the days after Kane Horman moved out, Terry and two friends stayed in communication using such phones. At least one of them was purchased by Dee Dee Spicer, another by a second friend from an electronics store inside the Lloyd Center Mall. The friend admits to me she used a fake name to buy the phone. She says they were simply trying to have some privacy as they tried to help Terry find an attorney. I just wanted to stop right here because this is um, Kyron and Kane and Terry's home at the time. Kane still lives here, but this is their property. Um, Kyron lived on five acres worth of land when he came up missing. Like we were pointing out earlier, this isn't the city living. This is out in the country. And felt their conversations were being monitored. As a practical matter, she says they also needed phones with AT&T coverage since their Verizon phones didn't have service at the Horman home where they were all spending considerable amounts of time. What remains unclear is why two additional prepaid phones were purchased at another store in downtown Portland the next day. Under the same fake name, the friend used to buy hers at Lloyd Center. She tells me she wow. knows those phones were paid. That's something. She, yeah, two more phones purchased the next day, and she says that she wasn't the one who did it. Terry is still claiming in... You know, because the other funny thing about Terry Horman is about, well, probably around a year ago now, she all of a sudden starts talking on Facebook after 13 years. She just oh, all of a sudden starts talking about makes certain you, things. Makes you wonder. 
yeah, what's changed in Terry Horman's world? Why is she talking? Mm -hmm. And she actually says, you know, I had nothing to do with the burner phones. I didn't tell anybody to burn buy the burner phones. The burner phones weren't my idea. I personally think in my own opinion, that that is a lie. I think she was controlling this this entire thing. But according to this woman, yeah. she had yeah. nothing to do with these phones being bought the next day. And Dee Dee Spicer swears up and down she only bought one. But here at the end of the clip, I want to show you what Desiree Young says about these cell phones. Okay. Terry. For in, in cash, California. but she did not purchase them. So Desiree Young, whoops. Let me just um, K2 News has learned the role prepaid. Yeah, paid for in cash, but she did not purchase them. Hmm. Oh, here we go. So on June 4th, 2015, Desiree Young says, absolutely, without a doubt, with all my heart, I know that Terry did it. I think she was working with one or two people, but absolutely she did it. We know at least Dee Dee Spicer. Yeah, she is one of them. And then. was Can you tell me a side note, but this just came to me. Was uh, Dee Dee cheating? with a man as well like a gardener no okay. um dd has only had one boyfriend her and not dd i'm all sorry of her terry life. i'm sorry terry um yes there was um speculation um i believe there's even proof that she was sexting with allegedly. michael we allegedly yeah, yeah allegedly sexting and having a sexting affair with Michael Cook, which was Kane Horman's friend from high school, and also the landscaper that was um, allegedly involved in the murder for hire. Bingo. Yes, allegedly. This is another Facebook post of August 6, 2015. Also, Dee Dee, why use throwaway phones to call and talk to Terry on and after? 6 4 2010. So remember, Kyron came up missing on 6 4, and this is later down the road. Five years later, she is saying they had burner phones on the day that Kyron came up missing. If you have nothing to hide and you were innocent, oh, and wait, that means you were in contact with Terry after March 2010. So many holes in your story, I can't keep up. And those are just the ones that the public knows about and we can talk about yeah i find summer that's crazy that is there's so many layers to this it is insane yes. I, I totally agree with you mm -hmm. okay how overgrown is that area? The poor kid could be close by and nobody would know. Uh, El, uh, El, El, well, the El entire El. area there, right after Kyron disappeared, they started looking um, in a two mile radius around the school was their main focus for several days. And mm -hmm. then they um, took their search over to Savi Island, mm -hmm. which Savi Island is 24,000 acres. It's 15 miles long. It's four miles wide. It's almost the same shape, shape and size as Manhattan. And 12,000 mm -hmm. acres of that is all wildlife area. So yeah, it's yeah. huge. And that's the not, I is. mean... The searches that they have done weren't just when he came up missing. They have done multiple. I did a live about the searches, and it took me hours to do the live because they have done so many searches for Kyron in that area. And you're talking about really rural area. You're talking really thick blackberry bushes, evergreen trees, ferns, moss, thick 
thick wooded areas. You know, we had somebody in our Facebook group. She had been on some of these searches that said they were using a gardening tool to look on the ground for Chiron, a gardening tool, very, mm -hmm. very intense. And, you know, they even had to repel with rope down some of these ravines off of these roads because of how deep the ravines were in these up and elevated areas. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the search was insane. You're talking ATVs, helicopters, horses, search and rescue dogs. You're walking, you're hiking, you're repelling. Um, oh, you're sorry, looking no, in rivers, you know, they brought in, uh, really special forensic stuff to be able to search in the water um, because Savi Island is surrounded by water. So Terry, we know Terry went to Savi Island that day. No, we don't. We don't know that she did. What we do know is, is that there is a cell phone tower located on highway 30, two miles West of the Savi Island bridge and uh, Terry's cell phone pinged and Savi Island itself doesn't have a cell phone tower. This is Got the it. only cell phone tower, but it sits right outside of Savi mm -hmm. Island. So we're not privileged to any of the inside information, but we do know that her phone pinged there and she admits to being on highway 30, but during the Dr. Phil show, she talks about the Savi Island Bridge, and he asked her, weren't there cameras on the Savi Island Bridge? And she said, oh, yeah, you would have seen me. Or he says, wouldn't you have been seen if you would have crossed the Savi Island Bridge? Yes. So for years and years, rumors and speculation, people upset that law enforcement and Desiree are spending years searching Sw Savi Island. And I'm doing research on these searches. And I'm wondering myself if there is camera and camera footage to prove she never went on Savi Island. Why is Desiree spending her time, money, and effort over there? So I reached out to the community. I reached out and I found out that there actually was not a camera on the Savi Island bridge in 2010. The Savi Island bridge was they redid it and they started you know a whole new structure on it in 2008 and the cameras and everything of course got taken down and it wasn't done and the cameras didn't go back up till 2013. so there was actually no cameras on the savi island bridge so here she is again controlling this narrative making everybody think there's cameras i would have been seen i'm not shown on footage mm. it's absolutely not true. Thank you, Darzilla. Thank you for uh, talking about Chiron. I've been keeping up with this for almost 14 years. I have him on my miss, uh, missing person page, in my opinion. Put those cuffs on her. Thank you, Darzilla. I appreciate you and all that you do as well. And I couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't I mean, more. I think it's coming. It is coming. Long. It is. It is. She knows it is, too. In my opinion, she knows it is. Uh, what, did Des I, what did Desiree say? Because she was having a car wash uh, mm -hmm. this past year uh, for uh, to continue to the searching because, you know, mm -hmm. she, she's privately spending, you know, for these searches and it costs a lot of money and she's out there washing cars and trying to do anything to raise money to find her son and she says we're coming for you don't sleep yes she does she has a new pep in her step in january of 2023 there was a new sheriff in town a woman sheriff 
um, she was actually married to the investigator in Kyron's case and that was doing this in 2010. And she went in and talked with her in March. And when the newspaper clippings and stuff came out in an interview, it mentioned that one of the last searches for Kyron was in 2023. This case is very still active and got ongoing. There has been lots, you know, there's lots of evidence out there, Desiree says, that proves that, um, you know, she had something to do with it. You know, there's GPS records. Evidence things. is evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence, right? Um, so there's that as well. And if she can't explain where she was. Now, was she when Kyron was supposed to get off the bus, was she home by then? Yes, she returned back home. So after she goes out on this drive yes. and, you know, she goes to the gym. She's only at the gym for 20 minutes. Now, Terry says that she got to the gym at 1139 in the morning. Later, camera footage from the gym shows that she didn't get to the gym until 12 20 which actually took her unaccounted time for 90 minutes almost to two and a half to three hours according to the book boy missing that was written by rebecca morris she's a new york times best-selling author um she worked very very hard with desiree to throw this book together and to get a good timeline if anybody wants to know about this case it's an amazing book please read it it says What's the it book all. called Boy Missing, The Search for Kyron Horman. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, she is seen on footage at 1220. She's only there for 20 minutes, and then she goes home. She's home around 1, 110. Um, King comes home about 2 o'clock. He was known for going to work and then sometimes coming home a little bit early um, and working from home a few days of work from his job at Intel. And um, yeah, Terry and Kane and the baby all walk down at 3.30 in the afternoon. Well, around 3-ish, 3.15-ish. Mm -hmm. um, Kane and Terry and the baby walk down the road to meet Kyron's bus. And Kane asked the bus driver to phone the school when he realized that Kyron wasn't on the bus. The driver makes a phone call and relayed the news to Kane that Kyron wasn't at the school either. So there is a, you say there's a 90 minute gap of where we have no idea where Terry is. It's longer than 90 minutes now. That was the original time. It's now anywhere from 90 minutes up to two and a half to three hours. Okay. So she's. Where's she? So she's last seen at what? Where was that? Um, she was last seen on any camera footage or anything at the gym. Okay, but w she was at the grocery store earlier that morning. Yes. Right. Um, and that was at what nine or ten? Her first receipt from the first Fred Myers was at nine twelve. And it, she was at the second Fred Myers between like, I want to say 9.45 to 10 a.m. in the morning. And then from there to the dry cleaners that she was not there for very long. Um, and then, yeah, she leaves on this little journey driving all over these rural roads, you know, part of me wonders if she was driving up and down all of these rural roads. Cause you have to remember Dee Dee Spicer's phone is sitting in her car. So her phone isn't pinging anywhere, but Terry's phone is it's pinging everywhere. So if Dee Dee was the person who possibly had Kyron during this unaccounted time, you know, she could have just been letting her phone ping everywhere to send these police officers on a wild goose chase trying to sure. figure something out. Mm -hmm. And after doing research on all of the searches, you know, 
it all focused west of the school in the beginning and that's where terry horman was driving around that day but if you look at the recent searches that have been done since like 2016 17 19 and 2023 those searches have all been doing they're all east and they're all really close to where dd spicer was working that day at westwind farms hmm. Now, I'm sure, how long after Kyron went missing did she move? When did she move out of state? Who? Um, I want to say 2013, 2014, something like that. So like three or four years later? Yeah. She went down to Roseburg. So Kane ends up coming back to the house that summer and she leaves and goes to roseburg and moves in with her parents where she stays for a little while and then she you know a few years later moves down to clear lake california where she starts getting into a lot of criminal activity down there she was told by the judge in the custody hearing you know she wasn't supposed to be around or like have firearms so down in California in 2015, she steals a gun from her roommate, and um, she's supposed to go to court for this. She never shows up for court. There's a warrant for her arrest, and a year later, she gets pulled over in a stolen car with this gun that she still had, oh my God. and <laughs> they arrest her. She goes to jail. Um she didn't get in any trouble for either i heard from desiree young not personally heard but saw on her facebook she talks about how the jury in the gun trial didn't find her guilty of that because they thought she had borrowed the gun from her roommate they weren't understanding that the gun was stolen and also <laughs> and i mean I'm just like, what? So she's not even supposed to have a gun. So why isn't she in trouble for that? So I don't know if like California and Oregon aren't like working with each other, you know, but she got away with that. And she also held a knife up to her ex-boyfriend. He filed for a restraining order against her because she was trying allegedly trying to get him to do another murder for hire plot and this was on a kyron horman advocate that runs allegedly it was this person um that runs a facebook page for kyron because she goes crazy looking for Terry. She puts lots of pressure on Terry. She has people that follow Terry. Everybody's, when they see her, she says, ask where Kyron is. People will take pictures of her, send them in. She had had enough. And my, my guess, my opinion, and yeah. And there's also another murder for hire because back in 1990, Terry Horman allegedly hired somebody to kill her ex-boyfriend. And in 2017, he comes up to Portland, talks to law enforcement, tells them the story. I guess they're at a park. This guy comes out of the bushes. He's got a gun. G-U-N, sorry. And... um. Wow. He ends up not, you know, pulling the trigger, but he later finds out, you know, that this was possible murder for hire and the police know about it and they're waiting to use that along with the other multiple murder for hires in court. They're just collecting all of this information, putting all this information together so that when they can go after her for mm -hmm. Kyron, they can just hit her with all, you know, barrels. They're just, they're going to nail her good. Get her with all cylinders. Yeah. And 
the cr controlling the narrative started, like I said earlier, from the very, very beginning. The very next day after Kyron comes up missing, she is emailing. Um, she is also, you know, she's saying things like, they're coming after me in the blogs. You know, she didn't change her Facebook profile to Kyron's um, missing persons flyer like the rest of the family did. She failed not two, but three liar de detector tests. And you hear a lot. Okay. Lie detector tests. They aren't admissible in court. No, they're not. But they're used as a tool by law enforcement mm -hmm. to find deceit. Right. And if it wasn't a good tool to use, law enforcement wouldn't use it. Sure. And hmm. it was like pulling teeth to get her to go take the polygraph test, the second and the third one, because after the first one, she comes home and she's hooting and hollering about how she failed the polygraph test. And I'm not taking any more, you know, they're, they're telling me that I failed. And yeah, if you want to clear yourself, we all know in these types of investigations, mm -hmm. they're going to look at the family and the people closest right. to Kyron. If you're not guilty and you want to clear your name, you cooperate, tell mm -hmm. the truth, take these polygraph tests. No one should yes. be pulling teeth to do polygraph tests. Nobody should be having to put you in the back of a cop car and say, show me where you were. Cops shouldn't be having to get footage from places to find out where she's at because her timeline's changing. Yeah. Running around all over town like a chicken with a head cut off. Exactly. I mean, this woman has been running free for 13 years. Um, I'd love to show these emails that she sent because it is very telling what she says. And it's the things that she says, too, because she points fingers like at a guy at a 7-Eleven off of Highway 30. He was asking where the nearest school was. The chaperone that was working at the school may have had something to do with it. The janitor at the school, he kind of acted a little fishy. All these people also all mentioned in the blogs on Blink on Crime, rumors, and controlling the narrative because she was great at it and she starts doing it the very next day let me see if i can find this yeah. and it also talks about the doctor's appointments hey graham sleuthin the tearing new suspicion settled on her, even writing, quote, they are blaming me in the blogs. I just want to scream. Terry, do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say? Do you know where Kyron is? Yes or no? She is the person everyone wants to talk. Kyron Horman's stepmother. We tell the world something. But while Terry Horman has remained silent in front of cameras, her fingers have not. These are excerpts from two emails that K2 News obtained, written by Terry to a source we will not reveal, sent on the day after Kyron vanished from Skyline School during that science fair. Now, investigators have said Terry is the last person to see Kyron, but this is what Terry wrote. The teacher thought I said I was going to take Kyron with Kitty for a doctor's appointment. I said I was going to look at other exhibits. How do you mess that up? His coat and backpack were still at school. I left the school at 9, and he was seen with a man, chaperone, and two girls after I left. I want to stop right here and talk about this because That's she talks about this coat and backpack. <laughs> so the coat and backpack are left at school that day, which people want to talk about. Well, the coat and backpack were at school that day. Why didn't the teacher say anything? I think it was a way for her to say exactly that. When people start asking her questions about, you know, what happened that day, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. Even his coat and backpack were at school. It was left sure. there. He was there. So I kind of feel like that's her whole reasoning for leaving the coat and backpack. But the really strange thing about that is in the book, it mentions that Terry, when she goes back up to the school, when they go there to start searching for Kyron, she takes that coat and backpack. She takes it home and she washes it. Oh my God. I did not know that part. 
A lot of the book is amazing. You know, we don't use all of our information from the book, but there are very huge, big, huge pieces that you can put together when you read the book. And it actually really helps, you know, that narrative that she's trying to tell, you can see right through it after you read the book. You can tell that's what she's trying to do. She also mentions the chaperone and these two girls. But if there was a chaperone that she really thought that was involved in Kyron Horman's disappearance, Kalia always brings up to me, why won't she do like a picture then for the police? For this like chaperone that she believed was responsible. And then in the picture that she took of Kyron, there's a man standing in the background. And a lot of people talk about him too. But law enforcement found out that that was just a parent of another child. And he was talked to and um, completely cleared. And I actually read that in a book that I just noticed about a week ago. Mm. So... She really, really tries hard to control. I mean, and here she mentions 300 people running around the school, no coordination. It was chaotic. Again, trying to put out this stranger abduction thing that law enforcement, you know, was positive, was sure. You know, they questioned over 500 people. They talked to pedophiles in the area and um, they even did lie detector test on some of the pedophiles in the area, they were able to clear everyone except for Dee Dee and Terry. There were no men on the chaperone list. That and it was highly chaotic. Had to been 300 people running around, no coordination. The reference to her daughter's doctor visit, not mentioned again in a follow-up email sent later that day. I didn't just drop him off. I spent time with him, took pictures, and he was in safe hands, I thought, as I watched him walk down the hall. Kids saw him after I left. Teacher put him as absent at 10 a.m. Someplace between 9 and 10 is when we think it happened. I have a receipt showing I was checking out at Fred Meyer 7 a.m. I went to another Fred Meyer looking for meds for Kitty they didn't have at the first Fred Meyer. Then I was trying to get Kitty to sleep in the truck for a few minutes, but no go, so off to the gym at 11.20, out at 12.20, home at 12.45, came home at 2, bus at 3.30. That was my day. They keep asking me. Now on my fifth interview with them. Isn't it so strange to see her? She's got a timeline for herself from the very beginning all the way to the end in this email, but she sure as shit can't tell law enforcement where she's at and what she's doing that day. Yeah, she's got it on paper, but that's it. She can't she can't prove she was there. Actions speak louder than words, right? Absolutely. Terry went on to talk about Kyron's recent behavior. The past two weeks, he's been acting really weird, staring off into space, can't remember anything, walks into the room and then back out, stopping to stare and then move on. The doc thinks that he is having many seizures, and I made an appointment on Thursday for next Friday to have him checked out. That contradicts what multiple sources have told K2 that in the days before the science fair, Terry informed Kyron's teacher he had an appointment that day, June 4th. That is why no one expected that he would be in class and why he was marked absent. So, you know, his parents have came out and said that, you know, Desiree Young and her husband, Tony Young, didn't see anything going on with Kyron. They didn't see him having many seizures. He wasn't, you know, doing all these things that she says he's doing. He's not spacing out or anything else. Kane Horman in an interview actually said that because of the baby's earache and her crying and stuff, you know, at nighttime, she was keeping the house up. Maybe he was tired, but he wasn't seeing anything strange and unusual going on with him. So again, mm -hmm. Again, she's putting out another story to control what people are going to think about her. Yeah, she's a she's a huge control freak. You can tell. Hey, I wrote something in back chat as well, like perm chat as well. Something. Okay. Uh, you would assume she would have got a prescription or over the counter meds for the day for her daughter had a doctor's appointment the day before. Well, she said. Uh, 
you know, she was getting the Tylenol, but she said Kyron had an appointment too, right? Um, that's, she said that Kyron had an appointment for that day, that Friday on June 4th. Yes. But there was a, there. there. There was no doctor's appointment. Desiree had to fill out paperwork, you know, to get all of the paperwork from the doctor for law enforcement so that they could look into that. Like I said, they honed in on her immediately. Um, yeah. Desiree Young here says there was never a doctor appointment. She made the entire thing up, and we knew this. The first night he went missing, I gave consent to get Kyron's doctor's records. So then when she was questioned, she said it was the following week to try to cause confusion and appear legitimate. But the truth is, Kane, Tony, and I never saw anything wrong with Kyron, and it was just a smoke screen to further confuse people so they didn't look at Terry for this. Like, maybe they would have, um, you know, walked out of the school on his own. It's all baloney. He looked happy, healthy in that picture, uh, standing in front of the science fair project. Nothing wrong, right? I mean. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't believe anything was wrong with Kyron. I 100% believe that she was the person responsible for taking him. And, um, you know, she, her daughter had a doctor's appointment the day before. And I think that's where a lot of people try, you know, they're confusing things. Because mm -hmm. her daughter, she took her daughter to the doctors after her amoxicillin was gone because her ears were still hurting and that's when the doctor said okay get her some tylenol or something why wouldn't you just go later on that day though to go get the medicine for her after leaving the doctors why wait until the next day to not run to one but say you went to two different trust stores me. looking for this medicine yeah you're going to want that medicine that night trust if you've got a if you've got a infant you that's when that you, if anyone who has kids, that you know that's when fevers spike is of the evening and early in the morning. So, yeah, and the the GPS locations for her are all over the place. Um, you know, they've been able to check lots of different GPS things, um, and. Yeah, none of it makes sense. According to Desiree, she says that that's where a lot of evidence is. She also says that there's blood DNA evidence that was found in the back of the truck. Um, don't know anything else about that. She just mentions it to somebody that's talking with her in a Facebook group. Um, there's another message by Desiree Young where she says that Witnesses saw two women, Terry and Dee Dee, off of Old Germantown Road, passing things from one truck to another. Interesting. Was, do you know what uh, Dee Dee was driving? Dee Dee, I don't know what she was driving that day, but she did leave her vehicle at West Wind Farms. I know she had like, I want to say like a maroon or red looking um, uh, SUV, but her brother, and this is pure speculation, okay. her brother yeah. owns a F4250 that looks exactly like Kane's truck. Oh, A lot of people talk about that. You know, Dee Dee Spicer's father was law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people wonder, you know, if he had something to do with helping protect her, if the brother isn't putting out any information about possibly loaning, you know, her sister, his sister, his truck. The other thing I'd love to talk about is the fact that there was an eyewitness that came forward Um that lived right around the corner from the Horman home. And he said that a truck came down to his dead end road on eighth Avenue, not once, but twice. The first time that it was seen was at 3 PM. The day that Kyron came up missing. The mm -hmm. second time it was seen was at 2 AM in the morning, late the fourth, early the fifth. And I've also, I've wondered if, she did 
borrow her brother's truck and if she was down this dead end very rural mm -hmm. road the thing that's so strange about this road is that it does dead end but there's plenty of places for you to turn around and once you get to a certain spot you can't turn around at all and he yeah. said that his name's jim kelly and he says that in a year maybe two or three people might accidentally come down this road but the same truck with a woman driving it came right. down his road twice. This is less than a minute or a little over a minute from Terry's house. And mm -hmm. also, when they go down to the bus stop, Kane says in a 2020 interview that they walked down to the bus stop, but then Terry all of a sudden turned around and walked back up to the house. She said she forgot something. And then she comes back. Well, if you think about the timing and Jim Kelly's story and this truck being down his road, if this person in this truck on his road has a burner phone and they're communicating with each other, I wondered if they had to get close because maybe in this area they have problems with cellular connections. And if yeah. that had something to do with her going back up to the mm -hmm. house. But if... That had nothing to do with it. What was so important for Terry to have to go back up to the house for? You know, get Good Kyron question. off the bus, walk back up to the house. Why are you all of a sudden, oh, I forgot something. What did you forget? What was so important? And that just came out in 2020. He's never mentioned that before in any of the interviews. And I just found that very peculiar. It's it's kind of suspicious to me. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, yeah, why? Um, you know, someone asked uh, a couple, there was a couple questions. Uh, I thought Dee Dee had borrowed a truck just like the other truck. It's not for certain that she did borrow the truck, but the truck that I know her brother had did look exactly like Kane's truck. The one that she was driving the day that Kyron came up missing. Okay. There's just and, no verifiable proof to prove that she borrowed that truck or had that truck. Where was, I think she means Terry and Dee Dee spotted again. Dee Dee and Terry were spotted off of Old Germantown Road, which is right along West Wind Farms, where Dee Dee Spicer was working that day, where Dee Dee Spicer left her job that day. A lot of people speculate, like, how and when did she leave? Was there another person involved? Even Kane and Desiree have speculated about a third person that it possibly may not be just, you know, Dee Dee and Terry. The biggest mystery to me is where did they meet? How, was Kyron moved around? Who had Kyron? You know, there was another witness that saw Terry in the truck uh, parked off of the side of the road on Newberry Road, which is the midpoint between where Dee Dee Spicer was working that day and Skyline School. I've mm. also wondered if maybe there was a meetup spot there. Um like I've said before, she starts at that second Fred Myers. She ends an eighth of a mile up the road in that same area. So I've always wondered if there was a pickup and drop off spot in that area. Um, there's so much to this case. I love answering questions. I would love to come back on your show and discuss this more, especially if people have more, you know, questions that they want to ask because Absolutely. there is so yeah. much to his case and so much more to talk about, especially, you know, like the searches, um, especially the searches over on Savi Island. I mean, multiple, multiple, multiple searches yeah, over there. It's uh, this is 14 years. It's hard to get through all of it in one live to say the least you know right um yeah absolutely i would love for you to come back for sure you um, know and if anybody out there is wondering what they can do to help kyron spread his 
flyer. We can give you flyers for him or for Michael Vaughn free of charge. Kaylea will send them to you. You can come to our Facebook um, group, Kyron Horman Case Revisited. You can come to Michael's Facebook group, uh, Michael Vaughn Case Revisited. You can even message me on our YouTube channel, Missing Pacific Northwest, Crimes Revisited. Um, Kaylea and share it on has, your social. Your social does them. Exactly. I mean, it, it goes instantly, you know, across the world as well. So, yeah, share them. Talk about him. It's really important because when things go down in the community, um, even though the community is never going to forget, they're, they're going to need support. Multnomah County is a little county. They're going to need support. And, um, you know, when everybody's talking about it, when everybody's sharing his face, it just helps so much, you know, with law enforcement, you know, and feeling like they have the world behind them because people from all over the world follow this case from everywhere. Yes. I have people reaching me from everywhere. It's a, it's, um, you type in, uh, I was, looking at unsolved missing children's cases and i always try to find you know similarities in different cases and you know and differences also obviously but uh i typed in unsolved missing children's cases and kyron horman was like in the top three of like uh perplexing you know what i mean it's it, mm -hmm. it's the thing with Kyron's, in my opinion, at least my opinion, is we know who did it, in my opinion. You know, but we we don't know where he is, right? Well, what happened after Kyron came up missing was the Casey Anthony case. And looking for a child or, you know, going after someone when... There's not a body to prove anything. Why hasn't Terry been arrested yet? Well, they haven't found Kyron. They don't know what to charge her for. Is he dead or alive? You have a lot of people with hopes and prayers, you know, that he's alive. I'm one of those people. You also have, you know, that he is gone. And that really, really sucks. And if you look at the searches and where they're searching for in the middle of the woods, you got to ask yourself, you know, is he dead or alive? And that's the mysterious part of this is why hasn't she been arrested yet? And I think it's coming. I think they took the circumstantial evidence. I think they're putting it together. And as the years go by, forensics and the stuff that they can do, it the upgrades. And it, better, yeah. Yep, better and better. And that's what Desiree says is happening. So because of Desiree Young's new pep in her step and the smile on her face that you've never seen before, because if you guys are familiar with this case and you see her talking on the news, she's usually in tears and distraught and there's no pep. Let me tell you, there's no pep. She is very, very distraught with her son's disappearance. And so mm -hmm. is his father. Um, but when I saw that interview that she did, during the news, I just was like, something big's happening. And yeah. because of the new sheriff, you know, because of the new search that was done in March of 2023, I think things are happening. And they keep a lot of things, you know, to themselves about the searches and what's going on. So, so yeah, don't blame them for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, we uh, we can talk behind the scenes and uh i would love for you to come on at least one more time and and talk about some searches and you know a lot more actually iron is is a case that's dear to a lot of you know people's hearts and he's been missing far too long far too long yeah and another thing to keep in mind, Kyron yeah. is 20 years old now. Know. You know, if he is alive, he's a young man. 
and you know you're not looking for a little boy and he could have tattoos he could have piercings he could have dyed hair he could be wearing contacts instead of his glasses so if you're keeping an eye out he has a um, two birthmarks, one under his right eye and one up above his right eye on his forehead. Um, those are two things that I really like to point out, just like he's not a little boy anymore. And there are marks that you can, you know, that you can look for. Sure. That's yeah. That's, yeah. Well, um, Samantha, thank you so much for coming on this evening. I appreciate you so much. You really know about this case and i again i can't thank you enough and um i do believe justice is coming for kyron and it's it's taken so long but you know it's in god's time it's not ours right mm -hmm. thank you for having me here this of brought course. so much awareness to Kyron, it's my first time on a big, big panel. <laughs> uh, I was so nervous in the beginning, oh, and then no, I kind of no. I got my groove. So, forgive me if I seemed a little nervous. I uh, no, yeah. you did fantastic. You did great. Everyone was complimenting you in here. So, oh, um, I couldn't even pay attention to that. That's I was like, nope, I'm not watching yeah. nothing that's going on over there. Too many people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you are wonderful. Thanks, Justin. It's everyone saying thank you. And oh you my did gosh, a, thank you guys. Phenomenal job. So um great love. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all. I appreciate you. Uh Josh is going live here in just a few minutes uh over at the lab. So make sure you go over at the lab and say hello and uh join him over there if you got time. Um, again, Samantha, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, we'll talk real soon. Okay, okay. Anytime, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Good night, everyone. God bless. See you on the next one. <laughs>